Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for tuning in for tonight's book chat, which is my first book chat for 2022. My name is Melody McAllister, and I love being here with fellow EduMatch authors, Grayson McKinney and Zach Bronda, the authors of The Expert Effect, a three-part system to break down the walls of your classroom and connect your students to the world, which they did quite literally. Before we get started, I'd like to give a shout out to those watching in our EduMatch publishing community and the Alice Keeler teacher tech community. You can catch this broadcast live on Wednesday nights on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube, and you can catch the replay on the same channels. The Expert Effect was a read that really resonated with me. I appreciate how the authors shared their pitfalls as much as their successes when it comes to teaching their students that what they do and what they're learning right now matters, and they don't have to wait to grow up before contributing meaningfully to society. This book gives insight on how to recapture the the imagination and innovative powers young people often lose during school and put those superpowers to use that makes others wake up and listen. And it's not just about project-based learning, although that is important. It's about listening to your students, giving them opportunities for choice and voice and letting them reflect on their learning outcomes and so much more. If you care about educating a whole child, if you need some fresh ideas for lessons, if you are wondering how to hand over the reins of learning to your students, this is a book you will devour. Zach and Grayson, it's such a pleasure to talk with you tonight. How are you doing? And can you tell us a little bit about yourselves? Yeah, thank you so much uh, for having us, Melody. Uh, we really appreciate it. Happy New well, Year. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Happy New Year to you. Yeah, thanks. So used to your props. I know I'm, I was waiting for the noisemaker or the party hat <laughs> or something. You've got the Christmas lights in the background, so that's still good. Yeah, and I don't have my props out tonight. I usually, yeah, but uh, another time for okay. sure. All right. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you everyone also for joining. Um, I'm Zach Rondo, and I'm a fourth grade teacher in Troy School District in Michigan. Um, this is my ninth year teaching. I have taught third and fourth grade, so that entire time. Um, and Grayson is my colleague who teaches two doors down from me in the same school. So Grayson, take it away. Yeah. Um, Zach and I actually used to teach together. Um, and at one point we were even in the same classroom. We had a giant open space with, um, two rosters worth of kids. We had 56 fourth graders. And, uh, since, since then though, I've moved up to fifth grade. So yes, I teach fifth grade now in the same school in the Troy school district, in uh, Southeast Michigan, about half hour north of Detroit. And um, I've been teaching since 2007. I've kind of lost count of, of the years. Um, but I've taught everything from kindergarten through sixth grade. And at one point I was an elementary Spanish teacher. Um, mm -hmm. And I've taught in urban and suburban uh, districts alike. And um, yeah, I've been so happy to work with Zach. Uh, I found a kindred spirit when we, when mm -hmm. we wound up at the same school. And, and you talk about like, like Zach, when you were, um, I, I don't want to say auditioning, but kind of were auditioning yeah. for your teacher position. You were in Grayson's class. And yeah, then you so I went, I went through a, a lot of interviews, but luckily on my last one, I had to teach a lesson in front of a fourth grade class. It happened to be the third day of the school year. Um, after I had graduated. So I walked into Grayson's class to teach a lesson on figuring out words and nonfiction texts that you don't know. Um, and luckily that lesson went pretty well because the next day I was, or two days later, I was in the classroom next door and we were, we were co-teachers just like that. <laughs> that is so cool. And so how many years did you teach together before you part, you know, before you moved up to fifth grade, Grayson? Um, there was the year uh, when he was brand new and then um, he went down to, he taught, you taught third grade, right? And then you were at another building for a year. And then when you came back, it was, it was just a weird coincidence where we had like, um, you know, schools kind of have bubbles of, of population where you'll have a big grade level and a small grade level. And so he came back and it was at one of those small years, relatively small, where there were only going to be two sections of uh, fourth grade. And so at the time, uh, our, our principal had just returned from a very innovative school out in Missouri. And she came back and said, I, you guys are the people to try this out. Um, I saw these learning labs they're called, and they had two teachers and they were able to do so many cool things like project-based learning, integration of technology, um, hands-on stuff, um, you know, real, real life field trips. And, and it just sounded so exciting. So uh, we're we're both the kind of people who just jump in with both feet and try try things out. And like you said, sometimes hit those pitfalls along the way. But um, usually it's worked out pretty good. And we, we see that in uh, how kids respond to the school. 
And so um, what made you guys decide, oh, let's write a book together? <laughs> well, if you would have told me that day I walked in an interview that one day we would write a book together, I definitely would not have believed you um, in that. But we um, actually, I guess we started working together as um, our district started a new position called a technology chair as we were going to one-to-one -one with iPad. So Grace and I split that position in our building and have split it ever since. But in that process, we started leading uh, professional development within our school and within our uh, school district. And we kind of started, we'll both tell you, like not really professional development, but tech trainers as like how to use this app or like 25 apps to use in like a 20 minute session. Mm -hmm. um, but from that, we have, you know, grown our I ideas. We have read a ton of books. We have continued presenting and building on present on those presentations. Um, coming up with new ideas. And finally, it kind of broke down and Grayson actually named the system. He said, like, well, we learn from experts, then they become and then they teach. Um, so we called it the expert effect. And then we just like we ran with it. I love that. And you even have an acronym for expert. Do you know it <laughs> off the top of your head? Um, we, you know, when we're, we, we use that acronym when we're looking for people to, um, to share the, to share the teaching responsibilities, really. Um, we, we fully believe in like connecting our students with people in the community, people who are doing the work, um, that we're learning about in their everyday jobs. And so we look for people who are experienced. We look for people who are exciting. We look for people who, um, you know, if there's a purpose to it. It's not just, oh, this sounds like fun. Let's let's take a little detour. Um, you know, people who are real and able to talk to kids and it, it makes a difference. Um, we've we've had a couple of people who, you know, don't quite connect with kids on an everyday basis. I think I got them all. E-X-P-E-R-T. Maybe I missed I'm one. I'm glad you took that one on. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think I could have done it. <laughs> Well, it's in the book. And I mean, it was good. I was like, you know, sometimes acronyms are more cute than they are realistic, but this one was pretty right on. And, you know, the X and the, uh, what was it? Excitement or? It's exciting. Yeah. We had to cheat on yeah. that one, but <laughs> Not a lot of X words that work. Yeah. And, and so the book is broken down in three parts. Um, what should educators expect when they're reading through this? So the first part of our, our system is to get students to learn from experts. And our, so the first part is learn from experts. Second part is to become an expert through project-based le learning. And then our third part is to teach the world like experts. So we think that's a good like hierarchy to go from learning to becoming to teaching. Um, so I can talk about the first part where it's really just like when you're learning about a skill that it used to be that the teacher had to be the smartest person in the classroom all the time you had to have all the knowledge. You disperse that knowledge to your students. Well, with all the technology we have and the ability and the connecting connectiveness of our world, we don't always have to be that know-it-all person. So when we get students to learn from experts, if there's someone who does this on a daily basis in their life, why not let our students learn from them, um, someone who's actually doing it, instead of us trying to like always pretend that we know all of the answers, but we can be part of that learning process with them too. I love that you said pretend because I've had years where I've had students that were way smarter than me, ask me questions. And, uh, I, you know, I tried not to pretend. I'm just like, I just don't know. But, you know, yeah, so true. What is what is the second part about? So the second part of the process is getting kids to learn, um, like Zach said, not just to memorize something um, to, to get a good grade on the test or to spit back that information that the teacher has bestowed upon them. But rather, um, you know, we, we call project-based learning, but really it's even more important than the end product of that project. It's the process. The beautiful thing about project-based learning is that kids are not only learning the content along the way, but they're also gaining those quote unquote soft skills that, um, that they're going to need for the real world. The ability to negotiate within, uh, within teams, with the, able, the ability to communicate their ideas, Na uh, navigate differences of opinion when working with other people. Um, and also in the process of creating something for the whole world to see, they're learning how to build a website or blog or start their own podcast, which um, I my class has done at, uh, at the inspiration of, of Zach's fourth grade innovators. Um, so we, our, our students are podcasting on a regular basis to share their knowledge. But, um, you know, it's not just about the final product. It's about learning those skills along the way. 
Definitely. And something that struck me was just, you know, you have to have curious kids to be able to do that. And you, you kind of, um, you, you helped to build that into your community. And I thought, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm homeschooling through the pandemic. I've been homeschooling my own children. And, um, even when, when they're not in a classroom, I mean, um, I just think, how can I do that? Like, that is something, it doesn't matter. Like, as the kids get older, they do lose some of that, um, whatever schooling they're going through. And how can we recapture that? And so I had um, some terrific ideas that I, I got from, like, you list a lot of different resources. And, and Zach, you said something that really resume, resonated with me as well, that when you first get into technology, like you can just go bonkers and you don't think about the end effect, but mm -hmm. then you start using the technology that's going to get you the outcomes that you're looking for, that you're hoping your students pick up along the way. And that's definitely been a learning curve for myself as well. Um, and I love so much that y'all are doing podcasts. If you want to share the link, I will drop it. Um, and how is that? And, and I want to tell you, so what are your students like? What have they thought about you writing a book? Um, have more have more people been listening to your podcasts? Um, yeah, they, it has been, it has been really awesome. It's been a cool, um, cool reception, especially last year with that group of students when it was like coming out and then, uh, they like saw online our book launch party and like were tuned in and watching, watching us that night. So that was really cool. Um, my classroom podcast has, has crossed over 4,000 listeners from like 38 or 39 countries now I've lost track, but it is like out there and it just makes the learning it makes them that much more excited to do it when they can kind of see that it's that kind is of, incredible it's kind of funny too because um mr rondo and mr mckinney are um two of the only men uh classroom teachers in our school and so often we'll see like we'll have kindergartners first graders coming up to us and i'll be mr rondo he'll be mr mckinney they say mr rondo and like we just go with it kind of and um it's been it's been really cool to kind of have that notoriety. <laughs> we have a lot oh, of like... six year old fans. It's nice. <laughs> right. That is so cool. Hey, Dr. Sarah. So she brought us all together. The amazing. Oh, yes, she did. She is. Yes. yes. OK, and this is I, I, fourth grade innovators. And Zach, I have been saying your name wrong. I apologize for that. That's, it's OK. It ha happens often. <laughs> Do you, do your kids, do they have like a special or do you have like, there, is there an episode on the podcast that really just means more than any of the other episodes or just really resonated with you? Um, well, for right now, we did one, we're working on one right now with this current class, but last year, I think it was, we did one on new year's resolutions. So if you want to talk to your class about setting new year's resolutions, we did one last year, but we're actually working on one hopefully to be released next week um, as well. I have a small group of kids working on an episode on goal setting and new year's resolutions uh, that should come out next week. That was our most yes, recent yes. topic as well. Um, we were inspired by John Gordon's one word um, platform. And then also the um, John Spencer has a very cool method called the slime method for setting resolutions. And it, he talks about things that you can start or things that you can learn or things that you can uh, improve on or maintain, even maintain. So uh, our kids kind of broke that down and, and did a, a cool episode. It was the first one for this new group, um, but we've had some really cool episodes in the past too. And most of those um, from my fifth graders have been based on the United Nations global goals, um, the sustainable development goals. And so they were able to like pick goals that uh, meant something to them. And they uh, were working on like a journalism project actually um, doing these more in-depth uh, reporting pieces and then they turned those into podcast episodes so that they could share their writing so that their writing didn't just end up on my desk, but it actually made it out to the world. So it's been what does it look like for the, your students to be working on a podcast? What does that even look like in a classroom? Um, for me, it goes on. on there's, many, there's many steps to it. There is, first of all, like brainstorming a, a big topic idea. And then when we have like a big topic, we come up with like as many subtopics as we come up with, uh, can come up with. And then I have like a, one of those random wheel generators with every student's name and I spin it. And when it comes up, they say what topic they want to talk about. Um, so I'm doing it a little bit differently now where instead of doing in the past, I've had like all students on each episode. So we came up with three big topics. So we divided them up into groups of one group of 10, another group of 10, another group of nine. So they're working in smaller groups to make their own 
episodes that'll come out three weeks in a row. Something cool that I um, have just added on to this year with the help of our amazing music teacher, uh, Ms. Pizik. Um, we've got kids actually composing music using GarageBand on their iPads. And so for the first time ever, we've had the intro music and outro music were original fifth grade compositions. Um, and that was a cool addition. Um, you know, it, it, so it's always evolving. It's always changing. And like you said about your own kids, like everybody has their own passions and curiosities and, and skill sets. And so with each new group of kids we get, um, you know, we have to adapt to their interests and the things that the things that are keeping them uh, engaged. So, right. And when you said, I love that you said adapt. Do you feel like the things that y'all wrote about would hold up through whether it was remote teaching or face to face? Like, did it matter? I I think they did hold up. And not to just say this, but like learning from experts digitally has become way easier than it ever has been before because all of a sudden. Like we started writing this in early 2019, so way, way pre-pandemic. Um, but then as like schools were shutting down and everything was going online, all of a sudden like every expert and organization came out and put everything online to stream and to join and to do. Um, so, and now everyone is a Zoom expert. Everyone knows how to Zoom. So asking people to Zoom in with the class is no longer like, uh, I don't know how to do that. Can we test it out first? Like everyone knows how to use, has the skill set. Right. So as far as like the learning from experts and the digital component, I think the resources have, you know, mm -hmm. exponentially gone up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. Um, I feel like um, I've gotten so much better in the Google tools. I used to be a Zoom, 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 but even the Meet. And you you guys have, like, even if you weren't, like, even if you're not part of the Zoom, um, you know, part all that stuff right now, like, you have put in the book just different ways that you can um, prepare yourself and your class um, to, to do well when you are inviting experts in. So, yeah, there were, um, you know, a couple of things that we were thinking about as we, as we were writing it. Um, I'll give you one example. Um, that one of the uh, most go-to platforms um, pre-pandemic was Skype in the classroom. Uh, Microsoft had a huge, a uh, huge wealth of like um, you know these these uh, virtual field trips that you could take or experts that you could connect with. And as we were writing, I think we were like in the final stages of our first draft. Um, Microsoft sent out an email saying we are no longer <laughs> continuing to host this this website. You're going to have to go to find find all these resources through these separate providers, and I was like, okay, well, that's okay. We're gonna we have to make some changes there, and it kind of hit me at that moment, like, it you know we could we could spend a year compiling all of these resources and make a list of all the people that we've talked to, um, but one of the reasons that we came up with the acronym was so that you could have uh, teachers or educators anywhere could have their own checklist of things to look for. Um, you know, to, to kind of do their own vetting um, because that list is constantly going to be updating and changing and like Zach said, growing, hopefully. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, we give like kind of the, um, the theory behind it and the why, and because we know it's, it's going to continue to change. I mean, technology is not going to stay the same for more than a, a, a school year, really. Right. And do you feel like there are things you wish that you could have added? So now you have to write, well, we'll talk about something else that's coming up in a little bit, but do you feel like, wow, like I wish I would have, we would have included this. Um, I mean, once, once the Microsoft uh, Skype in the classroom website kind of um, dispersed Flipgrid, um, it, you know, which is a great educational tool anyway, but they really have come forward with um, their Flipgrid live events. My class has gotten to um, hear directly from, um, you know, Peter Reynolds of the creator of the dot. Yes. And we've connected with Alan Gratz through um, a lot of like independent bookstore, uh, independent bookstores, you know, authors can't go on book tours like they used to. And so independent bookstores are hosting these live events now. And um, so, yeah, I mean, there's been a lot more opportunities, uh, but yeah, we'll have to just uh, keep sharing out. We do use a hashtag. We're, we're pretty active on Twitter. So if you look um for uh, hashtag expert effect edu uh, we're always sharing resources things that we see that are coming up uh, things that our own classes have done so it would be good to connect there i love that okay um and so we're, we're talking about author reads for your students but are you going to grace us with some author reads of your book i hope you'll tell us a little bit about it and then read it 
Sure, I'd love to. Um, I'm going to read just a paragraph right at the start. This is on page 13 of the book. And really, this is the portion where we're setting up the why and why we wrote this book, why we're doing all this, why this is important for schools and why we need to keep innovating. So this is the top of page 13. It says, our world no longer rewards people who are just good listeners and memorizers. Our world rewards people who can take what they know and apply it to unique situations. Our world no longer rewards compliant workers who can do one task really well. Our world needs makers, doers, innovators, and game changers. It's time we stop teaching the YouTube generation for an assembly line world. And in our book, we have all these big, bold quotes. And that's one of my favorites uh, of our big, bold quotes. I love it. I love it. All right, Grayson, tell us a little bit about what you're going to read. Yeah, I was going to I was looking for a part um, that kind of spoke a little bit more to what it means to be an expert. And um, this is about recognizing teachers as experts, too. It doesn't mean that you have to give up the reins of your classroom. Uh, so I'll just I'll read it says it's time that we recognize teachers as experts. Think about all the training sessions, multiple degrees, copious amounts of professional development. Countless hours spent reading professionally and voluntary Twitter discussions that teachers take part in while off the clock. This pr profession re receives too much negativity in the media, and it's time that we own the fact that we are experts in our own right, making an incalculable positive impact on the greater society. You are the expert in your classroom. You are the expert of your students. You are the expert of your curriculum. There's no consultant, author, or speaker who is better at gauging your learners and what they need than you. Wow. So technology will never replace them. You know. That's right. Super important. I love that. And tell us what's next for you guys. Do you want to share? Yes. <laughs> Going to ask if you wanted to do the honors. Well, we've had such a great um, reception from this book. And um, we were, we've actually been inspired by a couple of other authors who had a professional development book for teachers and then wanted to also share that message with students. So Zach and I are in the uh, final stages of creating a picture book, which is going to be a classroom companion to The Expert Effect. Um, so if you've read The Expert Effect and you've um, been into the message, we have a picture book that will hopefully be coming out later this year with amazing illustrations by another teacher from our district uh, whose name is Saraya Ali Ahmed. And um, it's going to be called The Expert Expedition. So it's going to be about the journey that students themselves go on and how they can uh, take these three parts of our system and apply it to their own learning life. And you both wrote that again together. Did you get student input? We've, yeah, we wrote, we're, go ahead. We, we worked, yes, worked on it together. Um, and we are most excited about the illustrations, which neither of us were capable of doing. And they're pretty awesome. We just were looking at the final copies uh, last Thursday. Um, and it's pretty exciting to see it all coming together. Oh, that's amazing. And, and, and so like, what's it like working, you know, not sometimes when people write together, they don't always come out as best friends at the end. What is it like writing together? It's been great. It's been great. We um, we definitely compliment compliment each other's style. I think um, mm -hmm. you know when one of us is coming up with big ideas, the other person is able to like go through it with a fine tooth comb, and uh, and make it look good, make it sound good, um, and like and, and and the most important thing was keep tying it back to this book, and you know bringing bringing in the big ideas from this. So um, yeah, it's been it's been a great experience. I think the most important thing is that when either of us, if we are like in the document and like make a comment that something is can change, we're both like extremely open, like, oh, yeah, that's a better idea. Let's let's change it. And I think that's really important in co-writing or Maybe. working together on anything. Yeah. And you, you mentioned early in your book, like, you know, that you're two white guys, like there's a lot like you having your students feel like they are represented in text is really important to you. And I um I, and that's how you brought in experts, because you knew that there was a lot for your students to see that was outside of the classroom. Do you feel like also that is part of your children's book? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, that was definitely one of our um, guiding principles. And um, our author, who is uh, Lebanese American and Muslim, um, also had a lot of input into the illustrations. And that was an important part of it for her as well. 
Um, my wife is um, an autism uh, teacher consultant. And so we've got um, diversity, not only of, you know, ethnic diversity and racial diversity, but also we, there's representation of, of all kinds of learners, all kinds of students. Um, and so, yeah, that was a guiding principle um, because we, and actually I have, uh, I have shown the rough draft to my, my current class and to hear them pick up on that and to, and to hear them recognize or recognizing that they can see themselves in the pictures um, and they, you know, they're asking me like, did we inspire that part? Did we, and of course they're demanding more credit because they're fifth graders <laughs> and they want to be famous. They say, you need to acknowledge us a little bit more in here. And I said, it is all inspired by you. And of course it's dedicated to you. So. I love that. That's amazing. And, um, I will be getting that book and I hope you will come back on and, um, we'll talk about that book as well. Uh, it's just so important for students to, and you, you make this a clear case in your book, but you are learning for what is happening now in your life. And, you know, I know that you guys will be teachers and, and you talk about how, what students say after they've left your class and, and you have some kind of, you know, smaller testimonials, but mm. that has to feel amazing, you know? It was, it, you know, one of those, um, one of those student testimonials at the end of the book actually came from um, every year, the Troy School District has a big welcome back um, party for all of the staff, um, the teachers, the custodians, the central office people, they all gather in our, in one of our largest high school auditoriums, they have the marching band playing, and the superintendent gives his speech. And for, for years past, um, we actually, you know, had experts come in. We've had George Kuros come and speak. Um, we've had other people uh, come and, you know, inspire us, give us the pep talk before, before we go back into the classroom after our summer vacation. And I believe it was the, I believe it was 2019 school year that um, our central leadership team said, you know what, we've had enough experts coming in. Let's have students um, welcome us back. And I, it's, I think it's a highlight of my career to have um, had four of my former students get up on the stage in front of the thousands of people in our school district and talk to them about um, auth these authentic learning experiences. And I, I it was so proud. And it, it, the quotes in the back of the book um, come from that speech. Um, yeah, it, it was just it gives me goosebumps still to think about it. If you have it, if you have a bookmark, you can read one of them. I agree. Um, I was going to see if I could find, well, yeah, I'll, I'll send you the YouTube link separately after this, but um, cause it's, uh, it's online as well. Um, oh my, you have it actually live recorded. That is great. Yes. Let's see. Okay. Um, he, he said, this was from Eric. I know firsthand the effort that is necessary to master new things. I've learned that if I'm dedicated, if I'm motivated, if I'm passionate about learning, then I can do it. And they just, there's their keynote speech, their Ted talk, like knocks it out of the park. And uh, yeah, I'll try to find that link and send it to you. Yeah, I, definitely. I was, I was front row in the audience for that one. And it was, it was pretty awesome. It was very cool to see. Yes. We have actually come to the end of our book chat. I wanted to tell you that this was, uh, this was such a great book. I, I really feel like, you know, this has been a hard year. Some people think it was even hard. It, this year has been harder than last year. And um, I would say that they are, that's pretty validated and in, in what other people are saying. This is a good uh, book that kind of breathes some life in where you, where you need it, you know, where you're struggling. Um, and you guys are so supportive of educators. Your online presence is amazing. Is amazing. Sorry about that. I'm tripping over my words, but I want to congratulate you. It hasn't even been a year yet, right? It was just a summer that you launched this. Correct. It was May. Okay. Well, congratulations on such a well-received and well-written book and also on what is coming next. I cannot wait to see your children's book. Um, yeah. and, but before we say goodbye, do you have any last words that you would like to share um, tonight? Um, just to, if, if you get the book and go through it, it, it's a fun process, like have fun with it, have fun connecting your students to the world. Um, and you get to be one of the students too, learning from these experts. So don't forget to have fun with it and enjoy the process with your students. And something that we always like to say is uh, dream big, but start small. So don't overwhelm yourself. Uh, you know, like you said, this is, this has been a tough year. Um, but it can, 
it, it can reinvigorate you. It can, it can reconnect you with why you went into education, you know, what, what the beautiful thing is about teaching and learning. Um, so yeah, I hope that you'll, I hope that you'll check it out. And if you do send us a, send us a selfie and uh, tag us and we, we love to see where in the world it's, it's gone. Yeah. Oh, we have a comment. I'm sorry. Almost. Um, somebody is saying something. Oh, hey, Rochelle. <laughs> I was like, I'm, I'm, I was going to put the outro. Guys, don't drop off. I'm going to put the outro on. But again, thank you so much for showing up. Thank you, Rochelle. Thank you, Dr. Sarah and everybody else who was watching. Um, we appreciate you so much. We hope that you will check this out um, and we'll see you next week. Next week, I have Dr. Monica Barnes on with the EdTech Essentials, which is great because we're just about to go to all these different conferences. So we will see you next week. Guys, stick around. Everyone have a great night. Thank you. Thanks, Melody. Thank you.